I am now going to turn it over to Miranda Migueli to talk about today's topic, Future Proofing Your Project's Maintenance, Continuity, and Succession Planning. So thanks again, Jillian, and welcome everyone to our training today on Future Proofing Your Legal Technology Projects, looking at maintenance, continuity, and succession planning. Uh, we really appreciate you attending. So I'm very excited um, and appreciative of our panelists uh, today. We have Christopher Alfano, who's here from Illinois Legal Aid Online. We have Jack Haycock and Kathleen Codwell from Pine Tree Legal Assistance. Also with us today is Sheila Fisher of North Penn Legal Services. Xander Karsten joins us from Legal Server. And again, I'm Marinda Migueli from Pro BonoNet, and I'll be moderating the panel. So I'm just going to start things off today with a brief introduction of the presenters and the themes of the webinar. Um, then we'll hear from Kathleen and Jack who will talk about their experience with staffing transitions while maintaining existing successful legal technology projects. Chris will cover his current uh, maintenance strategies being used uh, to, to support forms development and the forms project at Illinois Legal Aid Online. We'll then hear from Sheila who will share her experience um, and ideas about planning for future technology projects. And Xander will wrap things up with transition planning considerations that are useful throughout the lifespan of the project. Uh, so I wanted to start things off Last October, I gave birth to my son, who's pictured here. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about the lessons learned from that family leave experience. So I serve as a Law Help Interactive Program Coordinator at Pro Bono Net. So Law Help Interactive generally is a project uh, where we work with legal aid organizations and courts, forms online. Uh, last winter, I gave birth, October, and because staffing changes occur on a regular basis, whether temporary or permanent, one of the first things I did was to look for existing models to help make coverage easier for myself and for my colleagues. Uh, Xander, who's speaking later in the presentation, had just left Pro Bono Net and transitioned to Legal Server. So I basically used his uh, transition manual as a template for my coverage memo uh, and having that resource already available helped me to think through the best way to help my colleagues prepare to coverage, uh, do coverage for me while I was out. Uh, so one of the first lessons was just uh, see what existing resources that are working well are available for you. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can start there. Uh, the next lesson I learned was thinking about in addition to documenting and providing a coverage, a coverage memo or however you decide to document um, your responsibilities and assist people, you want to schedule time and uh, opportunities, multiple sessions to talk through with your colleagues what you've documented. What makes sense to you may not be clear for everyone else. Um, and it also allows you to answer questions uh, in advance if follow-up questions are prompted by what you've prepared. You also want to notify individuals that you work with both within your organization and outside of your organization on your upcoming leave. A lot of the uh, pregnancy blogs and some of the apps that I was reading at the time outside of work talked about these issues and even provided templates on how to notify um, individuals that uh, you work with and key partners. And you don't want those folks to be blindsided when you're out for uh, an extended period of time. A really important uh, lesson was be flexible and prepare for different scenarios. Um, with the pregnancy instance, you have a due date. And in fact, a lot of people were saying that as a first time parent, I'd be giving birth probably later than the due date. That wasn't the case. I gave birth early. So you just have to prepare uh, in that situation for different timing. But also more generally, whenever there is uh, staffing transitions, whether they be permanent or um, temporary, there are things that you can't anticipate and prepare for. So having some flexibility built in your plan is important. Um, and the last little tidbit is that I work remotely um, 
and my office culture and technology really allows me to feel connected uh, to the office even though I'm not physically present in the office. Sometimes we fall into habits of remaining connected. Uh, so the last lesson that I learned was prepare for the leave, but when it actually occurs, actually leave and unplug and disconnect. Um, so wanted to start things off with those uh, lessons. So next, just wanted to quickly share this uh, checklist from Pro Bono Net that uh, we've developed to help with uh, statewide website administration staff transitions. I'm sharing this first because I'm a huge fan of checklists, um, but also I think that this is helpful when thinking about statewide website um, staff transitions, but legal tech projects more generally, there's a lot of uh, things here that apply more broadly to projects. So uh, one, the first item on the checklist is uh, making sure that you have stakeholder committee lists and have opportunities uh, to meet with the stakeholders at their next meeting, so knowing when that takes place. Um, it's important to understand uh, websites, membership policies, if there's material, for instance, behind password uh, protected areas of your site, you want to know how uh, to control memberships moving forward and then have that policy documented or available for the transition. You want to figure out and discuss and document project priorities um, and also make sure that the credentials needed for a transition are available. So the first part of the checklist really covers some of the considerations for uh, before the administrative person or coordinator leaves, and here are some checklist items for after the person leaves. You want to make sure to deactivate relevant uh, personal user accounts and update relevant contact us and feed email addresses. You want to make sure that you connect uh, the new administrator to relevant listservs and resources. Um, make sure that there's messaging to key partners inside and outside organizations, um, letting them know that a new person is in the role and um, so that that new person can have access to relevant training and onboarding materials. And finally, um, if the transition isn't smooth, if there's some space in between um, one person leaving and one person joining, making sure that there's an interim plan in place um, to make sure that there's a fluid uh, maintenance of the website or whatever the project may be. So I hope my sort of quick uh, lessons learned and checklist was helpful to get ideas flowing and um, get the conversation started. I'm going to turn things over now to um, Jack and Kathleen, but also just wanted to flag some selected resources on the topic that I've added up as this last slide, and you can access these slides in the uh, handout section of the um, GoToWebinar, and they'll also be available online through lsntap.org. So thank you very much. Hey, everyone. Um, this is Jack Haycock from Pine Tree Legal Assistance, uh, along and with Kathleen. Kathleen? <laughs> and uh, you wanna... we... Yeah, I'll take it off. So we want to talk today. Recently, Pine Tree has undergone a really enormous staffing transition because Kathleen has retired, um, which <laughs> is not the first transition of this kind that Pine Tree has been through. Um, Kathleen, if you want to give a little bit of the history behind that okay. at Pine Tree. First, I just have to say I <laughs> I hadn't heard, even though we had a planning media, obviously I hadn't heard uh, uh, Miranda's talk and um, I was chuckling at myself about the part about uh, leave and then really leave. <laughs> that is such good advice um, and trust that you've done everything and uh, that's such great advice and I totally flunked that piece of advice because just I my last payroll date was August 18th and just yesterday I, I was online and I 
I'm still on our network, like wrapping some of things up, but I, I sent an email to Jack saying, oh, are you going to go to that meeting? That's a really important meeting. Don't miss that meeting. <laughs> of course he was going to go to that meeting, but I just, like, you know, I still wake up in the middle of the night um, thinking, oh, I got to tell Jack this or I got to tell Jack that. Um, so take Miranda's advice on that one, not mine. Um, so yeah, this is actually the uh, second time that we've um, transitioned all of our websites over from one person to another. Some of you may be old enough to remember one of the elder statesmen of the TIG world, my mentor, Hugh Calkins, and um, he transitioned uh, two websites over to me. We worked together for a long time, um, and so that made it kind of easy. And then um, at this point, I transitioned five to Jack, plus helping out on another four or five. Um, and I basically um, just used the same model that I had learned from uh, Hugh. So um, it's funny, when Miranda asked us to do this, and I think it's sort of appropriate because we've just been through it, or we're, we're at the tail end of going through transitioning a, a statewide website plus a bunch of other website administrative tasks. Um, you know, we really had to sit down and like, how how did we do that? And and assess um, the time we spent together. And it was a pretty interesting exercise because I'm not sure that we really knew how we did it. Um, <laughs> when we had our planning meeting, Miranda said, well, you, you're going to present your heuristic approach. <laughs> I didn't even know what that meant, so I had to look it up. And I looked it up on Wikipedia, and it was hands-on, a practical method, not generated, not guaranteed to be optimal or perfect, but sufficient for the immediate goals. That seems, that seems pretty right on. Were you the one that said that, Miranda? <laughs> um, um, all right. Okay, uh, so so that's kind of the background um, of of what's going on. Oh, and I, I had the advantage of Jack um, being in the Great Northeastern um, Co-op Program uh, his last year of law school. So I got him for two school terms, and we worked together real intensively for two school terms before I turned everything over to him and. I, I realize that's not always possible in every organization, but Hugh and I had a similar thing, and I just, it's, if you can get that, and I think our our executive director is gets that and is committed to that, it may seem expensive, but I just don't think there's any substitute for having, Miranda mentioned a series of meetings to hand things off. I just, I don't think there's any real substitute for just time together. Yeah, and so the method that we're kind of on about here is we're generously calling it a holistic approach to a staffing transition. So coming into this, um, we didn't really have any formal system at Pine Tree for managing this kind of staff transition. Um, a lot of the time, even though I was lucky enough to work in Bangor with Kathleen for about three months uh, to start off, after that we were in different offices and so trying to coordinate all of this remotely. Um, so we don't really have a formal system to present, but we do have some best practices to share that made life a lot easier for both of us. That picture on the right's uh, my office, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so probably the number one thing that has kept us on track with this transition is communicating. Uh, we talk frequently um, and really openly and frankly about not just the tasks that need to get done and the projects that we're working on, but also one thing that I've always appreciated from Kathleen is her honesty about what the difficulties are with certain projects or what things have gone wrong in the past that I can avoid those pitfalls. Um, that's really been something that has helped me immensely getting my head around this very amorphous uh, position that I now find myself in. 
navigating the politics of the court system. Yeah, there are a lot it's of things like that. Um, so something else, and this is kind of along the lines, but the court system is, there's, Kathleen has 20 years of institutional knowledge about all of our websites. And I had about a year to try and learn all of that from her. Um, so I don't know if Kathleen, you have any tips on how to prioritize what, uh, kind of what gets passed down? Well, you know, I, I it, it's inter it's, again, it's so interesting listening to Miranda about the checklists. Like, I agree, I really believe in checklists, um, but I, we didn't, and, and handbooks and documentation, I mean, that's all, those are all such good practices and ideal practices, I think. Um, but it's kind of contrary to the pine tree culture. Um, so it's it was a lot more haphazard, um, I think, in the way we pass things down. Um, and and later we're going to talk about the kind of project management systems that we that we think know we need that we don't have, and the kind of documentation systems we need and we don't have, and that's the weak point of of the, our tradition. Um, but the strength of our tr tradition on the other side of the coin um, is that kind of uh, style of mentorship that I mentioned with Hugh and that I tried to pass on to Jack. And that is, um, you know, not only showing him all the ins and outs of the website and <laughs> all the dirty laundry on the admin side where it exists and what he needs to clean up, et cetera, et cetera, but also just really helping him um, start to navigate all of all of the office politics, all get to know all of the players um, from the or other partner organizations, introduce him. I took him to the 20th anniversary of our um, of the organization in Maine that's the spin-off that does administrative um, and lobbying work um, and class action work. And you know, just just really uh, introducing him to the kinds of things and the, the players and um, the dynamics that you can't really do with, that you can't do with checklists, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that's been, it's been a big help trying to get my bearings here because so much of this job isn't just kind of working in isolation on the website. It's also needing to be in constant contact with this amazing expansive national network of people. And Kathleen, I think you've done a really good job making sure that I got a warm introduction to as many of those people as possible. Um, and so something else that Kathleen has already mentioned is that overlapping time has been probably the biggest advantage we've had. Um, we were able to work together on and off for about a year. And honestly, I can't imagine stepping into this job without having had some of that. Um, yeah, if there are any administrators on this call, um, I saw Sue on there. Um, I, 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 get, I get like dealing with the board and, and budgets and trying to squeeze every penny out that that may seem like a luxury, um, and it was kind of ideal with Jack because we got him for free for two school terms, and you don't always have that advantage. But I think to the extent that my observation in all of this is that our executive director, Nan Heald, was really supportive of that, and um, and there was some time when we were, we were both being paid, and. I just think that as an administrator, if I'm passing along a job like this, if there's any way possible to create that overlap, that it's it's really important. Yeah, agreed.
Oh, so Kathleen, this is my slide, isn't it? Is, yeah, it's your show. <laughs> Take it away. Um, I, you know, I, I think I love what I do, and Hugh loved what he did, and um, I think that Jack feels like he had a good orientation, and I think, uh, you know, eighty percent of that is is passing on the our enthusiasm and our love of what we're doing. Um, uh, Miranda mentioned documentation. Obviously, um, on any tech pro project, documenting is really important, and uh, we're probably not a, the best example in the world of doing that, but <laughs> it's really important. Um, and to, you know, to encourage as the mentor to encourage the person that you're passing along to. Um, to just, you know, just the obvious things of tell them to make mistakes, tell them to be curious, tell them to ask questions, um, you know, that they need to be engaged with you in order to, to be a good learner. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah, absolutely. It was kind of stunning to me when I arrived at the first day of my internship uh, over a year ago and Kathleen basically handed me the keys to the website and said, try not to destroy anything. <laughs> but, you know, it, it worked out because uh, Kathleen was an incredible mentor and really uh, let me have that room to make mistakes, but also made sure that I knew how not to make them again. Um, so if if we had to do this all over again, uh, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. We might have uh, started using some project management tools. Um, one that I've just started using that I really like is Asana. Um, I'm just gonna hit the highlights here. So it's free for up to fifteen users, which right now at Pine Tree is kind of where we're at. Um, I've found it really easy to use and organize. I like to sort my tasks by due date, and that makes me really happy when I sit down and try and figure out what I have to do in a given week or month or day. Um, there are some really interesting visuals for tracking the uh, status of projects, and it's easy to see how you're progressing over time. And for someone new starting out, this would be a really great tool to jump into because you can see all the history behind the projects, where it's progressed, who's working on what, um, kind of where you fit into it, and I think it would be really good in transitions for helping to get new people up to speed. I, I'm, you know, again, Pine Tree's a little late on the uh, <laughs> project management software <laughs> end of things, um, so we probably don't have a, a other than Jack having discovered uh, the software that he really likes, uh, we don't have any probably uh, brilliant suggestions. Probably a lot of you already have your favorite software. Um, but if you if you are sort of behind as we were, um, it's not perfect. But of course, Google Drive can go a long way to, toward having some kind of efficient coordination. Um, use Basecamp in the past. Um, I know those of you who remember Gabe Hammond, I remember she really pushed this many years ago. It's, it's an older system. Because of its usability, it's really simple. Um, I think it's kind of on one end of the spectrum in terms of if, if you're, you have an organization of people who are are nervous about using new software. Basecamp's like super easy and not real um, robust, but it can get the job done. We had a project with a bunch of judges and private lawyers, many older, and um, doing um, setting up a foreclosure diversion program in Maine, and we actually got them to use Basecamp, even though some of them probably still dictated to their secretaries, you know. Um, I always, my go-to person with questions like this always is Gwen Daniels, and um, she loves JIRA. Uh, she pointed out, she gave us a little run-through. Um, she pointed out she really likes how customizable it is, um, that it has a good notification system. 
Um, she likes the documentation features um, and that it has a really, it's widely used and has a strong support community. I don't think it has a free version and I don't think Basecamp has a free version. Uh, as Jack mentioned, Asana is free. Um, and since we're kind of behind on this, we wanted to ask for other people's either software you're using that you love or software you've tried that you would not recommend. Um, somebody, Jillian said Basecamp, a lot of people like Basecamp at Pro ProBonerNet, Confluence. Anybody else? Sandwich. Actually, SharePoint has not worked great for Pine Tree. We use that as an intranet, and I think we're switching, but that may have more to do with our, our use of it than inher it might not be inherently <laughs> that bad. Anybody uh, else have ones? Xander also called out Trello. What's that? Trello. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a huge fan of Slack, if you can get people uh, on there. Is that like S-L-A-C-K, Brian? Yep. Okay. Makes, makes things easier so you've got more time to Slack. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Jira, I think, is kind of at the other end from Basecamp. Um, I, maybe Chris will comment. I think it's a little more geeky, which is why Gwen loves it, but apparently they've gotten people to use it. Yeah, uh, we've used Jira, we've been using Jira for the past few years, and it's been a, a great tool for us. It, it is uh, it is not free. Um, I think with fewer users, it's a little bit um, less expensive than uh, what we're paying. But so I don't know how mm -hmm. cost effective it is for people, but it's a great tool. Great. Does anybody else out there have? No. Put it in the chat if you think of something. Um, I also chatted with Gwen because, I mean, if obviously there are continuous transitions everywhere in every organization, and somehow through all those transitions, Illinois has managed to have the best website ever. So I always go to Gwen to ask her what her tips are, um, and she talked about the Chris the weekly meetings that you have, and so that yeah. when someone does leave, um, there's lots of institutional knowledge. Everybody kind of understands a lot about each other's jobs and it makes the transitions easier just by having that great ongoing commu regular communication with the team. Um, Jack, you were going to talk. Oh, this one's oh, going to yeah. be embarrassing for me, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and so for anyone, anyone who's using Drupal, and I think other platforms probably have something similar, there is uh, there's the revisions tab when you edit things, which, you know, we have, uh, I think our practice has changed over the years on how we kind of document changes we make to pages on the websites, but I've tried to start up the practice of using these revisions so that, you know, when I come back to something three years later and wonder when on earth was the last time I looked at this, I'll be able to see what I did three years ago, and hopefully that will uh, jog my memory a little bit. And so guess what? Kathleen other... was too dumb to ha even have it turned on. <laughs> Jack had to discover it on his own. <laughs> you know, Kathleen, it's a learning process. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so if anyone else has any, um, you know, hot tips about how to make these uh, things a little bit easier. We'd love to hear them. I do have a comment from Abhijit, uh, who says that he finds Slack, going back to some of the tools, that he finds Slack and Google Docs very useful. Mm -hmm. Okay, Abhijit, if it's good enough for you, it's good enough for us. But it, is there a free version? For some it's legal aid? Or, Completely okay. free. That's pretty important for a lot of, not for Illinois Legal Aid Online, but for most no, of us. No, it's important for us, too. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I guess to sum up, staffing transitions can be really hard, but they don't have to be miserable. Kathleen and I have had a ton of fun in this year working together. We laugh a lot. We joke a lot. 
and I have learned so much and feel that I'm in, you know, at least a, a decent position to try to fill her shoes um, going forward here. And I love telling Jack the dark side of everything, Le legal aid. So it's been fun. It's been very enlightening. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thanks, everyone. Actually, just quickly on the Slack price side, um, it, it is free for 5 gigs of storage and 10,000 messages searchable. If you want to use it to archive stuff um, more than that, there is a uh, price to it. Uh, but for all the projects I've used, it's worked really well on the free model. Great. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sheila Fisher. Um, I've been working North Penn Legal Services for a couple decades, um, much like Kathleen. And also much la like Kathleen, I want to be retired sometime soon. So um, I'm looking back over my years. I was an attorney to about 12, 13 years ago, and, and basically I've been a full-time template developer since then. And um, But I'm the only one at North Penn that develops templates, and I'm talking about HJ and Hot Docs, and I'm the only one in Pennsylvania, for a fact. So we have these large banks of templates and I'm looking back at them and thinking sort of what have I wrought, and succession planning and also thinking about how did I get here in the first place and, and part of how I got here in the first place is because I've envisioned projects that I've gone out and sought grants for and maybe some of them have been terrific ideas and maybe some of them haven't been such terrific ideas. So um, um, I have learned a lot. I've been listening. Um, it was wonderful to hear about Jack and uh, Kathleen working together. I doubt sincerely whether I'll have that. And we have no team here, like I said, um, so to sort of work these things out. So this topic has been on my mind for some time. Oh, I forgot. Okay. So what actually motivates us for new projects? Well, there's a lot of motivations. Um, we have systems that are outdated. We want to increase efficiencies and cost savings. These are the, uh, normally what we tell funders. This is why we need to get some new money into our, um, our project to adopt or to take on new technologies. Um, and by the way, I am sort of my background is, I always call myself a one-trick pony. I, I do document assembly, but I think some of the things, I hope some of the things I'm talking about sort of applies to a wider range of technologies, not just document assembly. Um, we also go to TIG conferences and learn so much and see such great projects. That's also a motivator to want to adopt new um, technologies back at home. Um, there are priority categories in each of each year's TIG process. Uh, not all of us are LSE grantees and can get that kind of money, but a lot of us do. And uh, what I've been working on majorly for the last oh, year, two years, almost three years, are two TIG grants that I got in 2013. And in a way I say I got them because at North Penn, since I'm the only template developer and they're both document assembly um, projects, um, they've been on my lap. And um, in that particular year, 2013, I haven't really looked at the application process since, and one of the categories was expert systems, and that really piqued my interest. Since I've been doing this for a while, we all like to do things better and crazier and more efficient. Um, it really piqued my interest to do a particular projects, which I'll talk about during the course of my presentation. We also have now uh, LSE baseline technology guidelines. We are supposed to have tech plans. All of the things, these are the things that say, this is what we aspire to do. This is what we should do. Is there a project out there that can be funded to keep up with these guidelines and tech plans? And we do. We, we sort of like to be leaders, early adopters, when it's possible. So we take on a new project. And of course, we love grant money. And um, I don't mean to be so <laughs> sort, of, um, uh, sort of crass about the money aspect, but certainly um, TIG grants, we couldn't possibly take on the new projects that we have if we didn't have somebody funding us and helping us along the way. So, so now we're motivated, 
but the idea is here, and this is sort of a lesson that I can pass on, is don't bite off more than you can chew. And I, and I haven't actually, I don't think that's happened here, but I can tell you I've come near choking several times on trying to get our last two TIG projects done and on some other projects we've been working at here in the uh, program. So what you should you consider when you go off to do a new project? Um, there's the excitement and the glitz and glam of it, but um, does it fit in with the other technologies that are already in use? Or are we going out on a limb in order to bring money in or going out on a limb because it looks really cool? And then one of the TIG projects that we got was to uh, build um, an intake tool so that it could um, determine financial and case priority eligibility all in one. So um, our intake staff was sort of overwhelmed with several tools that they had to refer to for every little in for every intake that came in. And someone recommended that we consider the, uh, the software Neodologic and uh, touted it as being a very powerful tool. It is wonderful. I, I've seen it in action. It is spectacular. But as we got involved in the project, the grant was um, awarded to us, then we started really seeing more about the back end of it. We started seeing more saying, well, wait a minute, we were told it does this, can it do that? And um, so whether or not it really fit in with what we were already doing, or was this another technology that was going to demand a whole new set of skills, and as we've been talking about, a whole new set of um, maintenance um, skills as well. Um, and this is what I've just been talking about. We've, we would have had, there was new training involved. I would have loved to have done all that. It's sort of like those of us who get excited by new technologies are really ready and willing to learn, but you know, when it really comes down to doing it, are you really going to have the time um, given all your responsibilities? Um, are, is what you've taken on something that could already be met with something you already have in-house? I mean, how many systems can you maintain? How many systems can you be trained for, keep staff on, and know the technology well enough um, to take it into the future and not have it be abandoned. Um, here in Pennsylvania, we were the recipients of a Cypre Award, and the money was targeted for a new case management system across the state. Although we each have our individuals, we all moved from one case management system to a new one. And we're now working with Legal Server, which in a very basic way can do basic document assembly. So now we have people sort of like saying, well, we have this already for our case management requirements or needs. Can we use this also for our document assembly needs? And in some cases, yes. Why would you go on to Hot Docs if you have something that's already built in, people are already trained on, familiar with, if you really don't need to go to a more sophisticated level of using Hot Docs? Of course, from my point of view, <laughs> everybody needs to be um, literate in Hot Docs, but that's another training. So, um, and then how will the new technology advance service goals? We can bring um, technologies in. Um, we can get a grant to build some HEJ templates for pro se um, clients, but is it always, how is that going to actually work in with our service goals, or is it always going to stay on the outside? Um, once particularly the grant is over. So the object is to avoid those kind of project pitfalls, taking on more than you can possibly chew. And how would you do that? Well, first of all, you might want to ask experts and get second opinions. I had recommendations about Neotologic, but it wasn't enough. Um, for uh, my other big project is this monster called a divorce tracker, which we originated originally did um, in Hot Docs and H2J. But as the project went on, and as it sort of showed itself to be the monster that it is, it really exceeded the, uh, the functionality of H2J author. And so there was this major shift in the middle of the project because H2J really couldn't handle um, all the functionality we needed uh, to make this divorce tracker run. A divorce tracker is one big template that takes 
a pro se litigant in at the beginning, provides them with initial divorce forms, has that person come back, they feed back their answers to certain questions, it feeds on itself and produces the second um, set of divorce forms provided they did what they had to do, certain uh, qualifications were met, then they come back and do it a third time and the divorce tracker can help them get through to that final um, divorce decree that um, people want. Had I asked somebody like Bob Aubin, who's on the phone, or Bart Earle, um, I probably would have been advised that maybe I was biting off more than this I could really chew or more than the software could really do for me. Um, ask to see demos. Be demanding for specifics if it's a software you don't know. It may be a technology that is great for your program and will uh, fill a need, a real void, but be sure you know what it is rather than just getting a great recommendation and see it flash on the screen in some webinar. Also try to get commitment from your management for funding beyond the project term. There's nothing sort of more demoralizing. I've spent a lot of time and effort and developed a lot of templates uh, for our staff here at North Penn Legal Services for the pro se community in Pennsylvania. But um, when there's no new grant money, there's always a question of whether or not there's going to be money and time for maintenance of the projects that we have or are we going to be able to build on them for the future. It's sort of a tease to have a few custody forms when we really need more custody forms and then there's no money for that. So it, there's always going to be the maintenance issue. Fun, grants generally are not going to pay ongoing maintenance costs into the future. So there may be the grant money initially but you've got to make a commitment um, over the longer term. There's also uh, important to get some buy-in to the project. Uh, we've done a lot of document assembly here. S um, not all staff like the document assembly. Uh, the pro se projects um, are not necessarily referred to by our hotline people, um, by our workshops, which they could be incorporated nicely. So really to get everything up and running and to be part and parcel of a project's service um, goals, service plans, the more that it is incorporated into the general stream of what you do, your mission work, the more it's not an extra demand on the general budget, it's just all part and parcel of what you're doing. And then just to remember that although you can get a lot of money and everybody's giddy and happy when the project money comes in, in the end tech projects really are not money makers. So, if you're applying for a tech grant, just be sure you look the gift horse in the mouth because there's a lot of more costs um, than are ever going to be covered by the grant money. Or so. When I was just going through and putting together my slides, uh, Miranda pointed me to this particular very, very short article, but it really wraps up things very nicely about thinking about technology projects for the future, making sure you know what you're getting into, and how to make them a success. So, so that's what I have. Great. So we'll pause just a minute to see if there are any questions while I pass controls over to Xander. Hi, everybody. My name is Xander Karsten. I'm a project manager at Legal Server. And I'm just going to talk a little bit um, just as a kind of um, wrap-up of both some of the really great, uh, really great pieces and, and tips and thoughts that folks have shared so far, as well as a couple of my own. Um, and the reason that I tend to call this agnostic transition planning in just about every, all of the uh, project management um, kind of concepts that I, I tend to present on, I try to make sure are agnostic because, um, and that really just refers to platform agnostic. It doesn't matter, um, Asana that uh, Jack pointed out earlier was re is a really great tool. Um, but there are a lot, and there are a lot of other really great tools. Jira and other ones um, were mentioned, and so kind of just keeping it uh, to concepts rather than tool-specific uh, pieces. So, so the keys for me, and this is a lot of what I'll be talking about in the next couple of minutes, is uh, true for 
um, for any project management um, and really not just for a transition um, but for any time you're starting or coming into a new project and we've all sort of both been in that situation I'm sure where we are starting up a new project and we have the uh, kind of ability to start from scratch and move forward and get all of our documentation the way we want to um, and have everything move um, moving cleanly ahead and we've also I'm sure all kind of walked into projects where you know we are the ones who are transitioning in and uh, we need to you know take a look at what's there and um, and make sort of do a little bit of task finding through a, uh, a set of uh, projects that we have. So for any transition, you know, plan early and plan often. Um, you know, it's never, and we'll talk about this in just a second, but it really is never too early to start thinking about what happens when somebody leaves. Um, knowing your partners, knowing your deliverables, and knowing your tools um, will make the transition all the easier. There's nothing worse than realizing at you know the last minute, and um, this has certainly happened to me on a couple of occasions where you know I was talking through a transition of a staff member or a transition of a project, and it wasn't until you know a week or two after that project or transition had been uh, that project had been uh, transitioned that suddenly I remembered that there was you know a deliverable that I hadn't mentioned. Um, so just knowing that and being aware of all of those different pieces can be uh, incredibly helpful um, to know just at the outset. So planning early, it's never too late and it's also never too early to plan for a transition. Um, we, when I do a version, a sort of different version of a project management presentation at the TIG conference the last couple of years with, uh, with Anna Heinlein and, uh, and one of the things that we talk about when we discuss sort of ramping up projects and that initial project planning phase is to think through, you know, both in your own um, in your own work as well as in the work of your partners, who is going to take control, who is going to step in. Um, the best kinds of transitions are the ones like Marinda had when um, when she went out on maternity leave or when somebody gets a new job. Um, or when somebody you know retires and those are the best kinds of transitions and the ones that we have the most heads up about but there are also other transitions um, that we may not have the uh, the same luxury of time and so just being aware as you're kind of gearing up a project even okay you know if I if something happens to me or if I need to leave um, who would be a good kind of successor for this individual project can be a helpful you know, place to start, and also a helpful uh, thing to think about when you're uh, when you're working with your partners. So, sort of succession planning, um, and you know, I tend to like to think of this both in uh, discrete chunks for a project by project basis, as well as larger overarching pieces of my work. Um, but just sort of looking at that whole project and who understands where the pieces of the project are, who can absorb. Some are all of that project. What documentation may they need, and who can who else in the uh, in the agency can help support that person to make sure that uh, they're successful? Um, you know, for most of my uh, most of my projects now, and I really focus on onboarding people into Legal Server. Um, but this was true also with when I was at Pro Bono Net and when I was in Direct Service. Um, you know, having not only a supervisor who's there who knows um, what you're working on, but also having somebody who is at the same sort of structural or agency level or even um, somebody who you supervise who also knows, you know, where all of those pieces are and what's going on can be really helpful. Um, even if, you know, if you just are out sick for a couple of weeks, um, can be, you know, helpful to keep things moving and to have that institutional knowledge, sort of thinking about, who, who above and who at, at the same kind of work level that, that you are um, can really help support and make those transitions easier. So knowing your uh, partners, and there's sort of this question for, uh, we talk again, you know, when we are uh, doing a kickoff call or doing our first meeting with all of our partners, you know, who who is each person? And, you know, 
sharing email addresses and phone numbers and being able to reach out to everybody um, on, on a project can be really helpful, knowing what their role, but also knowing who's going to step in and play backup and who, who should I contact if I really need to get the answer to a question. And just you know, sharing that information um, for, uh, between the partners and whether you keep that information in, uh, in Asana, in JIRA, um, I have a Google spreadsheet. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, you know, it can be really, uh, really helpful to kind of think through that. Um, so by way of some kind of uh, documentation, when thinking about spinning up your project, or even if you are coming into a project that, uh, that you weren't in before, thinking through some accountability matrixing or, or responsibility charting can be really helpful just sort of laying out in one public document who's on the team, what part of the project are they responsible for. Um, there are some really great, um, there are some really great templates out there, either just in accountability matrixing or, uh, um, or thinking through, I, I oftentimes use a really simplified Gantt chart that just lays out on, you know, on the rows what the individual components of a project are, who it's assigned to, and then the columns are sort of when that happens. But if that doesn't work for you, um, you know, just having sort of what the responsibilities are, who um, who they are, identifying who will be their backup, either internally or externally. It may be that if a particular partner um, leaves an agency, that piece of the project may be absorbed by a different partner, and that's absolutely fine. Just sort of knowing in each project who that's going to be. And it also helps to analyze if uh, one person or one group is just, you know, taking on too much. One of the things that is uh, that is really uh, difficult and, and can be difficult for a lot of folks, uh, both within legal aid and um, civil legal services, but also in not-for-profits in general, is just, you know, the ability to say no. That, you know, kind of pushing back and, and knowing and sort of seeing that laid out visually can be really helpful to maintain. Um, to maintain the balance between partners um, and in, even internally. And then know your deliverables. Um, by the way, if anybody really loves these little cartoon guys, which I do personally, uh, the slide deck has uh, links to all of the uh, pictures as um, just as uh, credit and also uh, because I thought they were really great. Um, so, you know, making goals, deliverables, transparent and accessible. We all, you know, most of us here have seen sort of TIG documentation and TIG milestones. But if you don't have a document like that for other projects, it may be helpful to make one and to really think about, you know, okay, what, what are my measures of success and how am I going to, uh, how am I going to make that happen? Um, I find that that's also really helpful when I have a meeting, but I don't have an agenda. Um, we'll touch on meetings very briefly in just a second, but um, you know, it's, off, it's often often very helpful to just start with what are the goals here? You know, what are the goals of the project? What are the what are the short, medium, and long term goals? Um, and like I said, if you don't have that, you know, make that. And you know, one of the things that I found to be really helpful coming into a couple of different projects was even just to make it for myself. Um, if it wasn't something where I was in a position to kind of take any to take a leadership role, but you know, I it was helpful to me just to know, you know, what am I doing this project for? What is the ultimate goal? Um, and then if you do have a place to start um, to really have the ability to do project planning and that is part of your role. You know, starting with what those goals are and moving backwards can be a helpful way um, to think through um, sort of timing as well as steps. Um, it's, uh, it may be different for other people. For me, it's oftentimes really hard to kind of think forward. I, I tend to think backwards, where I want to go and then how am I going to get there. And then just knowing your tools, um, you know, I there are a ton of really great tools that are out there. Ones that I use personally, one that ones that uh, different partners of mine use. Um, I have found, however, that when I, especially when I'm collaborating with other people, Google Spreadsheets works really well. Um, everybody knows it; it's easy to maintain. Um, it looks enough like an Excel spreadsheet that everybody has seen it. Um, and it doesn't really require any additional 
uh, training. However, if you do want to use a specific um, tool like Asana or like JIRA and you want to share, especially with external partners, you're also going to want to build in some training time um, and maybe schedule a couple of meetings to do that. Um, that's true internally as well, um, you know, as folks have kind of pointed out, but it uh, can also be helpful to just build that into your project if you decide to use a specific, um, a specific tool for that. Communication, just sort of generally between, um, between partners and, uh, and internally as well, and, you know, I think that, uh, that other folks have said it, you know, just as well, but, you know, clear, uh, short, clear, concise, and often, um, you know, that the, a friend of mine does this, uh, has this rule where he won't send an email that's any longer than five sentences, um, which can be uh, which can be really uh, really helpful to kind of just narrow down what you really need to say. Um, I haven't gotten there yet because I like to use a lot of words, um, but uh, you know that's sort of something that's always stuck with me as a uh, as a good practice to sort of think about. And then. I also just wanted to kind of touch, especially folks have talked about meetings and using meetings as transition planning tools. And, you know, there's absolutely no replacement for, you know, in-person or, um, or online sort of meeting time and meeting spaces. Um, I have found in my own work and in my own sort of world that my meetings are only really as powerful as the follow-up that I'm able to do. Um, I've gotten into the habit of emailing out sort of summaries of all the meetings that I have um, each week, and, uh, and there are quite a few, um, but that extra kind of hour or two that I end up spending at the end of uh, each week just to email out and say, hey, thank you for meeting with me today or this week, this is what we've talked about, um, can really be helpful. And when you're thinking about transition meetings especially, um, and sort of setting agendas, it's also really helpful to have um, a summary email that says, you know, we met today and here are the pieces of the transition that, you know, we talked about. Here is the, uh, here's the most, you know, kind of important thing that I think that you should flag or that I want to flag for you. Um, oftentimes I don't have, you know, a, a pad of paper next to me and those pads of paper and slips of paper do end up getting lost and having them in one sort of uh, centralized place, both as the recipient and as the sender, can be really, really helpful. And then my final thought, and this may just be because I've been in California now for going on four years, um, but kindness in transition planning and in, um, and in project management in general is so incredibly important and is something that we don't often, you know, take the time to think about. We are so dispersed and even within agencies we may not, you know, see the people that we are communicating and transitioning off to on a regular basis because we're in different offices. Um, if you're working with external partners, um, oftentimes the bulk of our communication happens either via email or over the phone or through uh, web-based uh, web -based applications. And it's really hard. It's, only, it's impossible to see people's visual kind of facial expressions, body language. And it's really easy, um, and I know that I do this all the time, it's really easy to sort of read an email that doesn't start with hello as being, you know, a little more aggressive than maybe it was intended. So as, you know, both as somebody who is reading that email and also as somebody who's writing a lot of emails, just thinking through, you know, being kind to, uh, to the people that we are, uh, that we're interacting with and taking that opportunity to really share that kindness um, can make even the most stressful transition planning um, and transitions all the better. A little bit of humor, a little bit of kindness goes a long way, even when, you know, things are completely off the rails. Which happens. I mean, it, it, it happens. So, um, so yeah, those are uh, those are my major pieces and my takeaways. Uh, the time to plan is now. Um, no matter where you are in your projects, um, taking just a little bit of time to plan 
um, to plan on transitions and to think through what would happen. Um, knowing your partners, deliverables, and tools um, can make that uh, process all the easier. And then um, just be kind. <laughs>